we often imagine sexuality as an identity-based word or that it's something about our intimacies. But when we look around, we think about healthcare, when we think about marriage, when we think about public health, these are all places where our sexuality as individuals and as a group get really messy and blurry. My name is Eric Plemons. I'm an associate professor in the School of Anthropology, the University of Arizona, and I am the curator of the Downtown Lecture Series this year. And I often say, as an anthropologist, you always want to study a controversy because that's why you know that something really matters to people. The fingers on the drag can go snap, snap, snap. Snap, snap. I'm Harris Kornstein, and I'm an assistant professor of public and applied humanities at the University of Arizona. For the downtown lecture series, I'm looking at drag, and that's something that I've looked at in a couple of different ways. One is to look at the way that drag queens perform their fabulous selves online through social media platforms. I'm interested in the ways that drag performers really trick systems. They like drag makeup and how that can be used to thwart facial recognition. I'll also be talking a bit about my work with Drag Queen Story Hour. It's drag queens, drag kings, drag performers of all kinds, reading books to children in libraries, schools, community centers. Once upon a time. So we really try to use, you know, social justice children's literature to, to you know, invite discussion about sometimes difficult topics in society. I research early California and so I'm focusing in particular in post-Gold Rush California, a time of great flux and tremendous change. My name is Erica Perez. I'm an associate professor of history here at the University of Arizona. Almost overnight, California multiplied its population, and that led to certain shifts in land use, in political power, but most importantly in social relations between those who had already resided in California and those who were newly entering the region because the gold rush tends to bring in much more men than they do women. Women are faced with certain limitations. And so my research and the subject of my talk is really examining some of these events that are expressed through legal cases, criminal cases, even in the media, these accounts of seduction, breach of marriage promise cases, rape cases, any number of sex crimes. I think the study of sexuality is a really serious lens from which to evaluate American history. It reveals dimensions of power and asymmetry. It reveals racial dynamics, ethnicity, and it also gets us thinking about the fact that there is no monolithic sexual culture in this country, and there never has been. Crisis point since the Supreme Court decision in the Dobbs case. My name is Louise Roth. I am a professor of sociology, and I study gender law organizations and reproduction. So one important aspect of reproductive justice is ensuring that everyone has access to the reproductive health care that they need. And of course, in the United States, not everyone has access to health care that they need. Another thing that I really want people to understand is that outlawing abortion doesn't just outlaw abortion. It has echo effects in other aspects of women's reproductive health care, like how to manage miscarriage, because healthcare providers feel that under the current, in the current legal situation, they cannot provide the care that those women really need when they're having a miscarriage. If you don't give women the right to terminate their pregnancy, there's a good chance you're also not giving them the right to make informed decisions about what is going to happen to them when they give birth. Everybody has a sexuality and everybody has a gender. Everybody. It's just, whose do we get to talk about? I work with teachers and in communities to look at the ways in which we can make schools not just safer for LGBTQ youth, but spaces where they can thrive. My name is Carol Brochen, and I'm an associate professor in the College of Education in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Social Cultural Studies. In my talk, I'll give examples of stories from youth that I've met about what really transformative classrooms have looked like for them. 
share some stories from teachers who have taken risks and shown up for LGBTQ youth in ways that I think other people can learn from. I believe in the power of stories to build collectives and I hope that I can inspire some people to think about our communities in ways that, that they can learn to care for them and show up for them. What makes the, the approaches taken by social scientists unique and engaging is that we put people at the center of the conversation. So it's not about making a point, but instead, what are the concerns, what are the issues that are helping to shape the reality, the way that we're living it? And better understanding each of those things helps us better understand the problem. Hi, good evening everyone. Thanks for being here and welcome. My name is Lori Poloni Stoutinger and I am the Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the University of Arizona's People College. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our 10th annual Downtown Lecture Series. Launched in 2013, the Lecture Series was created to bring the university and the Tucson community together to learn about topics that relate to our everyday lives. Over the years, SVS faculty, along with university and community colleagues, have shared their expertise, adding both clarity and complexity to important and fascinating social topics. Former SVS Dean John Paul Jones was responsible for the first downtown lecture series in 2013. We're proud of the, le of the legacy this year's series is focused on sexualities. From the intimate to the institutional. Curated by anthropology, will address cultural impacts, the impacts of drag performance, 19th century sex scandals, and how gender and sexuality are taught not taught in schools. Now, before we get started tonight, I'd like to take a moment to say a few thank yous. First, to our series sponsor, Rick and Bill Small and the Stonewall Fund at the Community Foundation of Southern Arizona. Over the past 30 years, the Stonewall Fund has provided over $15 million to support arts, health, and educational nonprofits to benefit our community. To benefit our community. Thanks as well to our community sponsors, Joanne Ellison and Dr. Barbara Starrett, who have supported the Downtown Lecture Series since its inception in 2013. And finally, thanks to our media sponsor, Tucson Lifestyle. Can we have one more round of applause for all of our sponsors? It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Ken McAllister, who is the Associate Dean of Research and Program Innovation for the College of Humanities. Dr. McAllister specializes in digital humanities, rhetorics of technology, and computer game studies. He joins me on stage tonight to introduce our first featured lecturer and College of Humanities colleague, Dr. Harris Kornstein. Dr. McAllister, please join me on stage. Thank you, Dean Poloni Stoudiger. Your invitation. Good evening, everyone, and to uh, introduce my colleague. I am delighted to introduce to you tonight's speaker, my friend and colleague, Dr. Harris Kornstein. You're in for a treat. More than once, Dr. Kornstein has had me doubled over with laughter from stories about performing as their charming and sharp-witted drag queen persona, 
And once, that charming and sharp-witted drag queen persona had me verklempt with a hard-eyed critique of our society's crushing enforcement of gender binaries among young people. Now, this tells you a little bit about Dr. Kornstein's modus operandi, I suppose, but a far better way to wet your whistle for tonight's talk will be to share a handful of titles from Dr. Kornstein's scholarly book. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, God, another introduction where we hear an increasingly turgid recitation of academic titles, subtitles, and sub-subtitles of under and introduction. That's an award-winning work into the world. Everything I know about the internet, I learned from the Spice Girls. <laughs> the hips on the drag queen go swish, swish, swish. And not so fast, Mark Zuckerberg. An incisive scholar of new media and critical technology studies, Dr. Kornstein has most recently that merge the critiques of the surveillance state and magic. Think cruising apps and crystal balls, projects that are as fun to read as they are to ponder. Before I turn over the mic, mic I want to let you in on a little secret. We're all getting to experience Dr. Kornstein in a way tonight that is highly unusual for them. One need only peruse their prodigious list of current projects to realize that it's the unfiltered buzz and flow of collaboration that lights Dr. Kornstein's fire. Having had the privilege of collaborating with them myself, I can confirm that Dr. Kornstein inspires such enchanting encounters just as much as they seek them out. So, for just a little while now, let's all enjoy, in a special one-night-only solo performance, Dr. Harris Kornstein. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you to Lori and Kat for those wonderful introductions here tonight. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Plemons for curating this series for behavioral science. Possible for us to enjoy together today. So again, but first, you want to talk about drag. Talk, I want us Egg, to think about it as both a traditional art form rooted in gender bending community and highly stylized performance, but also as a practice of play and imagination that helps us transform ourselves and the world around us. And we're going to see a lot of pictures of queens tonight and some drag kings and other drag creatures, but I just wanted to start us on here, Divine, Jose Saria, and Vaginal Davis, who we'll talk about in a little bit. So drag is certainly having a moment now. Over the past decade or so, drag has gone mainstream, especially through the now global empire that is RuPaul's Drag. Grace fans are in the house tonight. 14 seasons and has had spin-offs in a whole range of countries from the UK to the Philippines to Thailand to Brazil. Now, just because something is popular, of course, doesn't mean that it's new. And drag in its current form goes back at least over a century to drag balls, as we'll soon learn a little bit more about, that were organized by formerly enslaved people. And some of drag's cross-dressed cousins, which I would argue both are and maybe are not quite drag as we know it today, go back centuries and appear in a range of contexts around the world. So in this talk, I'll start out with a bit of a definition and sort of cascade through drag history, um, including a bit of my own biography. But 
while I want us to learn from the past, what I ultimately is to look toward the future. One of the last things that a drag performer would ever want is to be called tired. That is an anathema of a word. It's a word that's one of the greatest insults to a queen. And drag as an art form, I would argue, is constantly innovating. It's always expanding itself and finding new ways in which to shine. And just as a little taste of that, um, what you see up here on the screen tonight is an image of drag queens that was generated by artificial intelligence by an AI program called Dolly that some of you might have seen. So this is what a computer thinks drag queens of the future might look like if staring into a camera. So what I'm gonna do is focus on two examples from both my research and my practice. This is really a sort of combined effort of stage and page. Um, so first, we're gonna think about how drag gets performed digitally via social media and the opportunities for disrupting some of the harms of digital technologies. So we're gonna look at the ways that drag performers perform their identities through platforms like social media and how things like drag names, drag families, drag makeup confound some of these algorithms that are constantly watching us. And then second, we're going to look towards Drag Story Hour, formerly known as Drag Queen Story Hour, but we just rebranded for coming out day yesterday. Um, and that's a program that is what it sounds like. It is drag queens, drag kings, drag performers of all stripes, reading books to children in libraries, schools, community centers all over the place. And we're gonna think about how programs like Drag Story Hour open up this form to new audiences and how they also have their own form of pedagogy, their own way of teaching each other about the world around us and hopefully transforming it as we do that. So across both of these case studies, uh, I want us to think about drag specifically through the lens of queer play. You're gonna hear me use the word play a lot tonight and we'll get into a definition in a minute, but I want us to think really about how these forms of play and drag uh, in the 21st century create new possibilities for reimagining a more just as well as a more fabulous society. So before we begin, I also just want to dedicate this talk to my dear friend Fatima Rood, one of my own drag mentors and also truly one of my most inspiring intellectual and creative mentors who passed away uh, just over a year ago. And I just want to call her into the space with us. And I figured I would start off as promised with a little bit of my own story here. So yes, the person standing before you is an assistant professor of public and applied humanities at the University of Arizona, and I am also a drag queen. And for quite some time, I really kind of wanted to keep these identities separate, partly and maybe largely because I would lose a little bit of its luster. But, you know, being a scholar, being a nerd, and what I realized is that one of the things that I had always loved about drag a little more big and put on a show in the backyard. But it wasn't until I had graduated college and moved to San Francisco when I finally started my drag career and really started performing in earnest. Uh, and when I started off, I started off performing a lot of political numbers, a lot of numbers that dealt with my cultural identity, um, a lot of numbers that dealt with the technological landscape at the time, uh, growing up in, in a sense in the Bay Area during the second dot-com boom, um, I really got to witness the impact of technology on both that city and kind of on our lives and our urban spaces at large. Uh, so I quickly also kind of began to incorporate a lot of technology and a lot of critiques of technology into my work, which is actually how I got back into scholarship after a bit of a break. Uh, I thought I'd show you just a few more kind of selections. This is from my one woman show, Is That All There Is? From my one woman show, Is That All There Is? that I did in 2015. Uh, and again, these sort of performances from Hillary Clinton to Kate Bush, the human menorah, Sia, ice skates, all sorts of things. Uh, and one more just claim to fame, because I have to shout it out, is that I did get to appear on Saturday Night Live with Katy Perry, which is a pretty cool thing for any professor to get to do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so let us take a look now at what drag is. 
Um, so I want to start with some definitions and some examples. And I'm sure you all have your own ideas of what drag is. And I want to honor those. But I also want to say that maybe you're not anybody with drag. So on the one hand, I want to argue that drag has this very capacious definition that drag can be almost anything. Drag can be almost any way that we kind of dress ourselves and present ourselves to the world to convey something about who we are. So in queer slang, people will often talk about various kinds of drag. Oh, she's wearing her nine to five drag today. Oh, he's in his school drag. Oh, they're in their church drag. So-and-so's in her army drag. All these sorts of things can all be different types of drag, whether they you know, are sort of the fabulous sequins that we might imagine or not. Um, on the other hand, I also like to offer a little bit of a more academic definition. Uh, so this is what I have always come up with, is that drag is a slippery term for a diverse range of highly stylized, gender fabulous, queer and trans performance practices rooted in play and imagination. And I really like to stress this because I think some people's definition of drag kind of starts and ends with something like, a man dressed like a woman or a woman dressed like a man. And while that might be part of it and that gender fabulousness might be part of it, I actually think that drag is doing a lot more cultural work than just helping us think about gender. And we'll talk about that in a moment as well. But first, what I really wanna do is highlight the element of play. Um, again, because I think that drag really is less about identity and more it's a, it's a form of performance, it's a set of tactics, it's a set of strategies for how we engage with the world and others. Uh, and play has many definitions from the traditional sense of uh, engaging in games and other activities that are meant to bring us joy and amusement to the more abstract or poetic approaches in which, say, we might play with language or simply act or joke about in a playful manner. Uh, and so as part of my teaching here at the University of Arizona, I'm lucky to get to teach an entire class on play. And so my students spend you know, basically a whole semester looking at a range of definitions, looking at a range of applications, ways that we can incorporate play more and more into our own lives. So what I thought I would do is share just one of these foundational definitions with you um, so you can step into the role of students. And actually, I think some of my students hopefully are here tonight. Uh, so hopefully you will recognize this quote from uh, Johann Huizinga from his seminal work, Homo Ludens, which was written in 1938 and is one of kind of the first real scholarly works to look at play. So he describes play as, quote, a freestanding activity quite consciously outside of ordinary life as being not serious, but at the same time absorbing the player intensely and utterly. It proceeds within its own proper boundaries of time and space, according to rules and in an orderly manner. It promotes the formation of social groupings which tend to surround themselves with secrecy and to stress their difference from the common world by disguise or other means. And so when I first read this definition in grad school, I could not help but read drag into it as a perfect example of play. We have this freestanding activity, this sense of it being outside of ordinary life, this sense of sort of both not taking yourself seriously, but also taking yourself very seriously, it happening in a separate time and space, and this sense of the ways in which this, especially this form of play of drag, really creates a, a sort of sense of community, a sense of culture, a sense of belonging, and sometimes not belonging within these communities as well. Uh, and furthermore, I would say that drag is all about imagination, experimentation, and changing the world around us by dressing up. As a form of play, sure, it's fun and it's entertaining. It's also often educational for audiences and performers alike. Um, but it's a mode of engaging various aspects of mainstream culture and literally playing with those elements of culture, giving them a bit of a queer twist. And so one of the things that I argue in my work is that, of course, drag plays with many different binaries, especially the binary of masculinity and femininity. One of the things that I think drag does especially well is to really show us 
that neither masculinity nor femininity belong to any one person or any one type of person, but that there are these kind of elements that we all are able to tap into and play with, you know, depending on how willing we are to put ourselves out there. Um, but again, I don't want our definition of drag to sort of begin and end with gender. And so I want us to think of other ways that drag disrupts and plays with a range of different binaries. So here's just some of the things that I think that, well, drag queens, as I'll argue, really kind of dazzle audiences. We put all of our information out there. We put all of our cards on the table so that it's often hard to sort of figure out, again, what's the true story, what's the fantasy, and why does it always matter? We can also look at the binary of success and failure to think about how drag, again, invites us to experiment, to iterate, to fail, um, that, you know, we don't, one person's success might be another person's failure and vice versa. Um, and sometimes we don't actually learn something until we actually fail at it. And then finally, to think about distinctions between pleasure and politics. You know, oftentimes we think that our politics must be boring, they must be, we can't have fun in them. Uh, and I think one of the things that drag does best is really to show us that oftentimes our politics and especially our political movements need those moments of joy, need those moments of fabulousness to sustain ourselves and to keep us going. So to that end, I want us to look at some examples of drag history um, that give us just sort of a, a taste of the many diverse and fabulous approaches to drag. Um, and I really do want to stress that, that drag comes in so many different flavors, shapes, sizes, colors, styles, attitudes. That's literally a line that I like to tell kids when I'm reading to them. And I always tell them that if they meet 100 drag queens, they're going to meet 100 unique, creative, and individuals. And I also want to stress that drag, as I mentioned before, is and can be for everyone. Um, and that, again, hopefully we can all learn something from drag queens, drag kings, drag creatures of all kinds. So, as I mentioned earlier, there are many examples of cross-gender or gender-bending theatrical performance that date back centuries. We can think about things like Kabuki theater or Elizabethan theater, in which men played all of the parts and so therefore often performed in drag to perform the feminine parts. Legend has it that Shakespearean theater is actually where the term drag originates, uh, rooted in the dresses that men would wear that would drag across the stage. That's one of those things that if I were Wikipedia, I'd ask for a slightly better citation on. So it's kind of a nice myth, but I'm not, I don't want you to walk away thinking that that's necessarily fact and, and signed, sealed, and delivered. Um, but today, I do want us to focus on examples of drag that really are explicitly tied to queer and trans communities and practices. Because again, I think drag really is um, rooted in our communities, and, and there are some other examples, you know, Rudy Giuliani on Saturday Night Live, for example, that maybe don't quite make the cut of what I would consider drag. So first off, we have uh, William Dorsey Swan, who was a formerly enslaved individual uh, who was known for throwing drag balls in Washington, D.C. in the late 1800s, uh, post-emancipation. Uh, and, you know, was really kind of known for using the term queen of drag um, and that being one of the, the more modern uh, or one of the, the early contemporary uses of the term drag. Uh, I should point out that none of these pictures are actually William Dorsey Swan. These are other participants from drag balls at the time. I don't believe we actually have pictures of him. But there's a great article from The Nation uh, and a book coming out that details more about his life. Uh, this, moving us a little bit ahead into the early to mid part of the 20th century, uh, is Jose Saria. Jose Saria was a drag performer in San Francisco who really kind of uh, had an interesting blend of politics, humor, um, entertainment in her work. So she's probably most famous for running for the San Francisco Board of Supervisors about 15 to 20 years before Harvey Milk famously ran and won, and for sort of showing that queer people could indeed form a powerful voting bloc and actually, you know, make strides in electoral politics. 
But what I really love about Jose Saria is that she was also kind of this weirdo, this, this person who um, was eccentric, who was all about uh, building community and sort of speaking back to the, those in power at the time. So in the early and middle of the 20th century, as some of you might know, many things for dealing with these things. She would do things like have performers wear buttons that said, I'm a boy, so that when police came up to them, they couldn't accuse them of impersonating women. She would also lead groups of bar patrons down to the police precincts after the, there were these raids and roundups of people in their community, and they would go sing a modified version of the British anthem, which she entitled God Save the Nellie Queens, to sort of you know, raise the spirits of those people who had been locked up and protest these injustices. And we're going to see a lot of kind of interesting examples of politics, um, both cultural, electoral, all sorts of politics in this little history lesson. Uh, we also have in the later part of the 1960s, just before Stonewall, uh, there's this wonderful documentary called The Queen, which is about a drag pageant by Mother Flawless Sabrina, who we see here on the left. Um, on the right, we see uh, some members of the House of Labeja. Uh, and this was kind of one of the, the both kind of glamorous and I'll go back to those in a minute as well. Of course, we can't think about drag history and herstory without looking to the Stonewall Rebellion, that kind of monumental, momentous occasion that marks some would say, the, the modern era of gay liberation and gay rights. We have figures like Sylvia Rivera, Marsha Payette No Mind Johnson, and Stormy DeLavere, who are all both queer and trans people of color, but also drag performers in their own right. And um, as we can you know, hear from many myths, may or may not have been some of the first people to throw the first punches or the first bricks at Stonewall. Um, but we're also known, again, for organizing in their communities, for organizing uh, especially what they referred to as street queens, uh, or what we might refer to as trans women now, uh, who often also performed uh, to, you know, organize for their rights and mutual aid. Also in the 1960s and 1970s, we can look towards the coquettes, who were deeply influenced by the hippie and countercultural movements of the time, and really rejected a lot of the beauty standards that we saw in some of the more glamorous aspects of drag that I just showed you. They had this very kind of DIY, crafty look, using a lot of materials you know, that were found and thrifted and just available at hand. We can also look towards the 1970s with the founding of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, an order of gay drag nuns who, you know, are kind of both parodying the, the church and the order of the nunhood, but in some ways are also deeply reflecting it. They have chapters all around the world that raise money for organizations, that provide safety at events like Pride, um, and that really see themselves as spreading a mission of joy and absolving people of their sins. Uh, we can also look towards the 1980s when we see, again, kind of a rise in more punk and DIY aesthetics. Uh, again, one of my icons, Miss Vaginal Cream Davis, uh, who was a punk legend uh, from Los Angeles. And on the right here, we have Lee Bowery, an infamous club kid. Uh, and you can see, again, really pushing against the sort of conventional styles of beauty, especially, you know, white, wealthy standards of beauty um, uh, that were dominating at the time. Moving ahead, too, we can also look towards the ballroom community. Again, this was part of the community that Krista Labeja helped found, a primarily black and Latinx uh, queer and trans community that I would always say is kind of cousins with drag. It has some elements of drag, also some elements of, of other aspects of, of identity and performance, but wherein people often uh, kind of dress up and walk runway categories, trying to imitate but also critique, again, different standards of beauty, fame, etc. And many of you may have seen the documentary Paris is Burning or the TV, sh TV show Pose, which addresses elements of these, this community in particular. Uh, I would also be remiss if I didn't talk about the wonderful contributions of drag kings. 
you know, most of my work focuses on drag queens, which is just happens to be one of the, my own biases and the ways that I've kind of limited the work that I do. Um, but I should say that I came up performing personally, predominantly with drag kings. And for those who aren't familiar with drag kings, you know, these are performers who, rather than kind of exaggerating and, um, you know, poking fun at different forms of femininity, are really doing the same with masculinity. Often these are queer women or trans masculine performers, but not exclusively. I think one of the, the beautiful things about drag is that anyone, regardless of their identity, can participate in and kind of perform any sort of other identity. Um, so here we have Arizona's own Freddie Prince Charming. Uh, we have Wang Newton and Tenderoni. Again, some great names. Um, and then finally, I also want to end us uh, in the present where, again, I would argue that drag has always been and always will be in some ways political, just in the way in which it disrupts these different binaries that I've been talking about. But there's also ways in which drag has once again entered Cisco. On the right, we have maybe a girl who's running for a congressional seat in Los Angeles. Um, and then I also wanted to kind of close out on a, a slightly grimmer note um, to look at the ways that drag really just in the past few months has entered mainstream politics across the country and across the world. And that's been in the form of attacks on drag performers, um, kind of starting off with more um, far right groups, but creeping their way more and more into mainstream political discourse. So um, we've seen things like the Proud Boys and other white supremacist far-right militias attacking drag story hour events, but also just regular drag shows, regular drag brunches, um, because they believe that we're somehow indoctrinating children or you know, trying to spread this far-left ideology. Uh, we've also seen mainstream politicians, including politicians in our own state, threatened to outlaw children's participation at drag performances or attendance at drag performances, to criminalize parents who would bring their children to there. And this is, this is part of a, a wider range um, of attacks on LGBT and especially trans communities that we're facing right now. Things like bills that prevent children from accessing health care, um, playing sports, accessing bathrooms appropriate to their gender, all sorts of things. I should say too that Literally in the past couple weeks, I've had my own entanglements with this um, kind of wave of anti-drag rhetoric. Uh, Marco Rubio has come after me for my work with Drag Story Hour on a couple of different occasions, uh, again, accusing me of indoctrinating children, and most recently including footage of me reading at a story hour in one of his campaign videos where he says that we're, quote, trying to turn boys into girls. Um, so, you know, I just want to kind of highlight this to again show that drag, you know, while I'll always take it seriously, is really kind of having this serious moment in our culture right now. Um, and we really do need to sort of pay attention because in many ways, I would say drag members or drag performers are members of our community who are, are highly visible um, and therefore kind of highly subject to attack. But in many ways, I would say that we're just the canaries in the coal mine of the wave of anti-gay and anti-trans rhetoric um, that's been coming and will continue to come, especially around language like groomer uh, that's become more and more mainstream. So let's look at some ways that we can begin to resist some of these more nefarious tendencies in our culture and in our politics. And I wanna start off with my first major case study here, which is looking at, again, drag queens and their performances of self that complicate uh, kind of the harms of digital technologies. And so this is a story that, again, begins somewhat personally. Uh, in 2014, a group of drag queens, including myself, all suddenly found ourselves kicked off of Facebook for allegedly using uh, fake names and for violating Facebook's so-called real names policy. So in the span of about a week, almost everyone I knew in the drag community had been targeted and we were basically told either give us your you know, government name or you're kicked off the platform. 
And for many of us, that would have been kind of okay. You know, Facebook was already sort of starting to be on its way out. Um, but for many of us, it was also a way that we connected, you know, with our fans, with our friends. Um, it's how we booked shows. It's how we let people know about the shows that we were performing. And we also very quickly heard from a range of other people who had also been unfairly targeted by this policy. We heard from a number of indigenous Americans and other communities of color whose naming conventions didn't match the kind of standard Anglo-American naming conventions that one might ex that expect that Facebook was upholding. We heard from survivors of domestic violence and other sexual violence that were using pseudonyms in order to maintain some sense of privacy from their abusers. We heard from transgender people and especially transgender youth who were often in the process of transitioning and using new names to better reflect their identities on platforms like Facebook. And so because we were located in the San Francisco Bay Area with Facebook's headquarters in our own backyard, because we had already seen that technology had been kind of negatively impacting our city, um, and because, frankly, we were good rabble-rousing drag queens, we decided to protest at Facebook. And so we went down to Facebook. We also happened to be bright and colorful and sparkly and kind of an unusual news story. So we got a lot of attention and we were able to convince Facebook to change its policy, to give people their accounts back, to take some important steps to resolve this problem, not just for drag performers, but for all of these different communities I've been talking about. Uh, unfortunately, you know, nothing is perfect and I still get requests from people probably once a month asking me to help them get their name back on Facebook, uh, which is kind of frustrating because, you know, I'm not trying to be Facebook's one queen customer service agent. Um, but, you know, I, I do want to sort of acknowledge that we were able to make certain things happen. Um, at the same time, though, that we were doing this work of getting people back onto this platform, I was also very ambivalent about it. Because again, on the one hand, I recognized that for many people, this was a platform that literally could often right, that, you know, trans youth were using this platform to connect with others, to get support, to come out and transition. But on the other hand, Facebook, as we all hopefully know by now, uh, is a platform that has been guzzling up all of our data. It has been tracking us, our every movement. It has been inventing new and more nefarious ways to understand our behaviors, our identities, our attitudes, our opinions so that I can use that data to sell ads to us, to, in some cases, spread misinformation um, or allow other people to do that on its platform. So I, I felt a way about it. I felt weird about this sense that I was actually getting people back on a platform that, at the end of the day, I thought really needed a lot of reforms. Um, conveniently, around the same time, I started noticing this interesting trend which was that a lot of drag queens were posting screenshots in which uh, Facebook's facial recognition algorithms had incorrectly tagged them as each other. So it had basically said, oh, you look like this other queen. You know, there was kind of this almost feeling like it thought that all drag queens looked alike. Now, obviously, you know, it's, it's algorithms, it's AI, it's not actually thinking things. Um, but this sort of became this inside joke among a lot of queens, you know, sort of joking like, oh, the algorithm thinks you look like her, and that's kind of a read. Um, and so I began to think about, you know, was there something in this accident? You know, clearly this was an unintentional kind of failure on Facebook's part to have its algorithms work for drag performers. Um, but I thought, what if we kind of exploited that? What if we really saw this as a loophole and kind of dug in there? And so being the good drag queen scholar that I was, I began to formulate some research questions that I want to share with you now. Um, in a broad sense, I wondered how do drag performers break the rules of social media platforms? So what about our identities, what about our performances really kind of change uh, or kind of disrupt the normal flows that happen on these different platforms? And then related to that, what can we all learn from drag performers to protect ourselves from the harms of digital technologies? So in some ways, how can we kind of think like drag queens in order to better protect our privacy? 
So that's what I'm going to talk about for a minute here. I do just want to share that I've published on this work um, in both scholarly and popular formats. And at the end of this talk, I'm going to give you a link and a QR code if you want to do a little bit of more reading on this. So stay tuned for that. But I really kind of began to think about this uh, in three major ways. Um, I first was thinking, again, about questions of visibility and privacy, or what I call visibility and the drag closet, thinking again about how so many of our strategies for maintaining our privacy really focus on going in, on enclosing, on kind of hiding and protecting our information. And how, again, drag offers this way of really kind of throwing it all out there, of literally throwing open the doors to the drag closet and letting people see every sequin, every bead, every feather, every speck of glitter, and kind of using that to, again, mess with and sort of pollute the databases of large platforms like Facebook. One way that I think that we do that is through what I call our mutable and multiple identities to think about how drag queens are constantly shape-shifting. You know, we're constantly coming up with new looks, whether that's just because that's sort of how we are or whether because we're impersonating or imitating or performing as different personas. Um, and that, you know, it's not just drag queens that sort of modulate the ways that we interact with the world or interact with different communities, but that we all do that in many different ways, right? We all might talk to our mother in a way that's different than we talk to our coworker that's different than we talk to our students. And so being able to celebrate that kind of multiplicity, that ability to change uh, in different contexts is something that I think we can all learn from drag queens. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg famously once uh, stated that he felt that people who have multiple identities show a lack of integrity. And so in many ways, I was sort of trying to challenge that assertion by thinking about the deep integrity that it takes to do something like drag. And then finally, to look at what uh, we might call the lie that tells the truth. Uh, this is a quote from a scholar named Philip Kaur, who writes about camp and drag. Um, and helps us think about, again, the ways that fantasy and reality are often deeply intertwined, both in drag and in elements of everyday life. Um, the way that oftentimes, you know, kind of telling a little bit of a fib, telling a little bit of a fictional kind of story actually helps us arrive at deeper truths. And, um, and how that's an important part of kind of our narrative and storytelling about ourselves as well. So what I want to do now is show you just a few examples of some of the ways that I think this happens on a platform like Facebook, as well as an experiment that I did to try to um, kind of prove how we could sort of weaponize some of these strategies of drag. So first is once again to return to drag names. And here are just some of the names of some of the people who I interviewed. And I invite you to kind of read them aloud with the little voice in your head, because some of them only really make sense when you kind of hear them spoken in that way. Um, but so again, drag names are, um, are, are deeply meaningful. They're not the legal names. I, I like hearing the little chuckles as people have uh, <laughs> revelations here. Um, but drag names certainly aren't our legal names. They don't have that same legal gravitas, but they often do have a similar social weight, right? That one of the things that was most uh, concerning about being kicked off of the platform of Facebook in the first place was that many drag performers, you know, while having deep friendships, only know each other by our drag names, right? That that, that shows this kind of level of intimacy and relationality um, that's very specific to this community. And so uh, there's something important about recognizing these forms of naming each other that exist outside of our legal structures. We can also look to the ways that drag performers often fill out their profiles on a platform like Facebook. This is starting to, it's a little bit old uh, in terms of the interface at this point. Uh, but you can see here, Landa Lakes, uh, her name itself is kind of a reclamation of the uh, anti-native stereotype of the Landa Lakes butter. She's an indigenous queen. Um, and you can see if you look really closely here that she has um, some kind of true information about herself in the world, you know, that she graduated from the University of Oklahoma, um, but she also blends in elements of fiction, saying that she also graduated from the Oswego College of Young Ladies in uh, the class of 1918 with a major in etiquette. 
And so we can kind of see how people um, begin to sort of shape these personas that really blend elements of truth and fiction of who they are in the world, and sometimes tell us something about who they are through that kind of fictionalization or that fabulation. Uh, as another example, this is uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Sissy Paychex, who performs with a kind of, uh, kind of Tammy Faye Baker-esque, like preacher's wife kind of, uh, style and you can see that in her likes on the platform of facebook she has things you know both queer artists drag parties things like that as well as a number of kind of religious um, uh, pages that she's liked as well again mixing fact and fiction in blending uh, these different elements of her persona we can also look towards drag families uh, drag families are a long tradition in drag communities in which often the first person to paint your face is your drag mother or sometimes a seasoned queen will adopt a newcomer uh, as part of her drag family. Um, and, you know, once again, Facebook has a section in its database that invites people to share their family members as a way of understanding social relationships, figuring out new ways to advertise things to people. Um, so to use this in ways that reflect non-biological drag families is again, kind of messing with, kind of polluting this platform, um, but, but still reflects very real social relationships. Um, this is Juanita Moore, one of the legends of San Francisco drag, um, where I've done my research. And, you know, she has this very, very large family of children, of spouses, et cetera. Um, but these are people who do show up for her. These are people that she regularly cooks dinner for, that show up when she's sick, um, that carry her bag into the club. So these are real social relationships, even if they're not exactly the kind that Facebook developers have in mind when they're creating these databases. Um, and just as a fun little fact, I always get this uh, Mother's Day greeting because of my own drag daughter once a year, which always sort of makes me chuckle um, about it. But sort of circling back to where I started this section, thinking about drag and facial recognition, again, I really wanted to think about the ways uh, that we could kind of weaponize some of these tactics, that again, we could take the ways in which this system wasn't really seeing drag queens in all of our complexity, and to kind of use that against it to avoid being tracked and recognized in various ways. Uh, so again, I thought about these failures of facial recognition. This is an example of uh, my friend and colleague, Monistat, uh, who is of um, uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage. And, uh, you know, complained to me that basically every other Asian or Pacific Islander queen always gets tagged as her and vice versa. And basically, you know, queens of all kind of brown ethnicities also tend to get tagged as each other. You can see here she got tagged as Tyra Banks, as RuPaul, all these sorts of things. Um, as yet another example here um, on the bottom left, you see my own drag persona and you see a whole range of different people and in some cases paintings inanimate objects that were incorrectly tagged as me. And in a few, maybe there's kind of, yeah, thanks for laughing. In a few, there's kind of like, you know, maybe some recognition, but in many of them, it's sort of like, well, it's really just seeing a drag queen or it's really just seeing this exaggerated makeup. So what I really wanted to do was think again about how we could weaponize this, um, to think about how we could use these failures to prove the inefficacies of Facebook's own facial recognition algorithms. So what I've done is created what I call an anti-data set of images of um, drag performers where I'm, we're intentionally trying to provoke misrecognition in some way. So what I do is I photographed uh, about almost 30 performers, each in three different looks. One is a look where they're out of drag. One is a look where they're in a kind of typical drag look for them. And then the third is a look where I ask them to kind of take inspiration from the drag legend Divine and to try to kind of paint in her style to get a little bit of a consistency, to see if that consistent look can help trick these facial recognition algorithms. So this just kind of shows what I ask them to recreate very severe eyes, very severe cheeks, ex extended ma uh, mouth, et cetera. And I upload these to Facebook um, in order to then see who it gets right and who it gets wrong. 
Uh, and before I show you the results, I'm just going to show you a few more examples, partly just to, again, kind of show you some of the wonderful diversity and creativity in these different drag performers. And these are just drag performers in one city, you know, in one part of the country. Um, but you can see a lot of the, the ways that they really incorporate elements of culture, um, of identity, of creativity into their style. Um, and so here we can see a kind of visual representation of the results of this experiment, where the ones that are shown in green were correctly tagged, the ones that are shown in red were incorrectly tagged. And so over 10% of my images were incorrectly matched, um, which is not a huge percentage, but is a lot more than Facebook's 2 to 3% that at the time they were claiming uh, was their own kind of failure rate. And so if we look at these two, we saw some interesting results. These are all the ones that did not, that were incorrectly tagged. Um, we had two performers that were both incorrectly tagged as a third performer uh, who was not actually part of the study, but who, you know, based on being on Facebook, fa uh, the algorithms seem to incorrectly identify. Uh, again, you know, to the human eye, there's maybe some similarities, but probably not enough that you would think that facial recognition would actually pair these two images. Uh, there was one performer who out of drag and in their sort of divine inspired drag were both incorrectly tagged as uh, other people as well. And then there was one performer who because they paint in a very kind of abstract way was not recognized as a face at all. Um, so again, you know, this was an experiment. I knew at the end of the day that it wasn't necessarily going to, you know, be a huge gotcha moment for Facebook or take down the company, and that in many ways the company could just use this data to make its algorithms even better. But I did want to show that really at the end of the day, play could serve as a form of resistance, that play could be a way to really go up against these big and powerful companies and show them that they're not always right all the time. And that contrary to a lot of the kind of discourse that we have, again, around privacy, that suggests that you need, you know, super sophisticated encryption or, you know, different software to counter different other types of software, that sometimes really all you need is an imagination and some basic makeup that you can pick up at your local Walgreens. So, Again, I want to sort of reiterate here that drag functions as a form of play, um, not just playing with our looks and performances, but also in this case with and against technology to test its limits and find some of the bugs and loopholes or new ways of interacting with technologies that are not what their designers intended. So in this case, this form of play can not only be joyful and creative, but can also help us counteract some of the harms of digital technologies, such as surveillance and the commodification of LGBT identities into neat and marketable categories. <sighs> All right, so let's take a, a breather there. And I wanna also quickly share my second case study with you, which again is to think about drag story hour and drag pedagogy. And I already told you a little bit about Drag Story Hour. It is what it sounds like. We, you know, read in schools, in libraries, in community centers. We tend to read books that deal with topics of queer history, multiculturalism, being your most fabulous self, standing up for bullies, the kinds of things that you might expect a drag queen to want to read. Um, and the program was founded in 2015 in San Francisco by author Michelle T, along with Julian Delgado Lopera and Virgie Tovar. Um, and then it quickly spread around the country and around the world. We now have over 50 chapters uh, in places like here in Tucson, Arizona, in El Paso, Texas, in Raleigh, North Carolina, in Tokyo, in Berlin, in Mexico City, all over. Uh, and again, you know, being something of a drag queen scholar, um, I was having a lot of fun performing Drag Queen Story Hour, but I also wanted to think more deeply about the kind of work that it does in the world. Uh, and so fortunately, I paired up with a friend of mine, Dr. Harper Keenan, who's a professor of education at the University of British Columbia, uh, to really kind of dive in and think about what it would look like to theorize Drag Story Hour, and specifically the pedagogy that comes along with it. Um, and I just want to take a moment here also to plug, um, you saw in the video earlier that uh, one of the talks coming up, uh, Dr. Carol Brochine is going to be talking about the power of stories 
gender and sexuality in schools, which is not necessarily about drag story hour, but certainly adjacent to some of the things that I'm gonna be talking about here today. And again, I just wanna highlight that um, I have uh, published some of this both in academic and popular press uh, formats. So I'll share that link with you uh, at the end of the talk. But to give myself a little break from talking and to give you just a little bit of a taste of what Drag Story Hour feels like, I'm gonna show you just a few minutes from a short documentary about us called Tall Tales uh, with True Queens, which was directed by Christina Budelis and Leandro Baladotti. So uh, we're just gonna watch a few minutes of this clip right here. I love being creative, I love exploring with makeup, hair, all this. It's a long process, but it definitely pays off. There's something rebellious about being a cis man and getting dolled up, putting on a wig, walking the streets and going to my gigs and taking over the space. I think kids don't always know what to make of us. Things like gender are like the last thing on their mind. They look like um like mermaids and queens. Are we done yet? Hi, I'm Miss P. I am the drag queen for Drag Queen Story Hour this hour. Welcome! When I first heard about it, I was just like, where can I sign up? And I was part of the first few girls who started Drag Queen Story Hour in New York City. So when I put on my wig on my dress, like, I'm ready to go save the world. How many of you want to be a mermaid when you grow up? For me, I think Drag Queen Story Hour is just such a natural fit. It's like one of those ideas that's just so good that I'm shocked that no one had thought of it sooner. So what do you think a drag queen is? Uh, a queen of dragons. A queen of dragons. Yeah. We really are. We entertain, we lip sync, we are funny. We're like clowns, but prettier. And I get to hang out with people like you. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Yes. Story time at a Brooklyn Public Library prompting a protest this morning. And it's who is reading to those children is what parents are upset about. We have a drag queen, which is a man dressed as a woman, coming to read to children, not about cat in the hat, about gender fluidity. I like to invite them in to see before they judge a drag hour. I love my wet shoes. I think there's just something about being larger than life and that's really what they react to. I love you get a lot of oohs, ahs, wows, and what's that? <laughs> to kids, I think, you know, drag queens are princesses come to life or superheroes. One of the kids said, a drag queen is someone who dresses fabulous, fancy. And I was like, oh, you correct. You're correct. Kids, they're imaginative. They're all about play. They haven't been baked into, you know, society's norms and expectations. So I think to them, things like being fluid with their identities comes really naturally. They're setting a great example as being different, and there's nothing wrong with that. All right. So if you want to watch the rest of that, um, I encourage you to check it out uh, when I post the links later. Um, and again, just to hit you over the head with some research questions, uh, you know, thinking about drag story hour and drag pedagogy uh, led Dr. Keenan and I to, to formulate these questions. What might programs like drag story hour offer educators as a way of bringing queerness into educators of all kinds, whether in formal settings or informal settings? Uh, and what if we took play defined looks strategic defiance, humor and shame, and going beyond, beyond um, that again is very rigid, that's really about, um, that again is very rigid, that's really about, you know, memorization, about using your flashcards, passing the test, and how drag and the play that comes with it can really uh, be about that kind of opening up of possibilities, that opening up of the imagination, that creating a sense of, of play for the sake of play without having to necessarily have, you know, strict ABC uh, learning uh, guidelines or outcomes behind it. Um, we've also thought about, again, the role of imagination. 
um, and how if you think about the root of the word imagination is really about making an image. It's about creating something in your mind and often then creating something out into the world. And again, sort of what better metaphor for drag than to think about how we literally make over the images of ourselves in order to experience the world in a different way, in order to force people to interact with us and uh, you know, take care of us in new ways. The second is what we refer to as aesthetic transformations or serving looks. Um, again, we want to think about the, the benefits of unscripted forms of teaching and learning, um, as well as what it means to really highlight the unusual. Um, so, you know, when a drag queen walks into a classroom and kids realize that the person reading a story to them isn't just their typical teacher or librarian, but is this person who's, you know, decked out in six inch heels and a six inch wig and sequins and feathers and all these sorts of things. What does that, what kinds of questions does that raise for kids? What does that make them about the world around them? How does that lead to discussions about what's typical, what's atypical, and why? Um, again, this is where, you know, we can kind of are naked and the rest is dressed. What to do was maybe loosen that up a little bit and invite a little bit of unruliness, a little bit of improvisation, right? which is not necessarily to shut them down, but is often to kind of sass them back and invite them into a dialogue. And we think that this is, and we think that this is particularly effective with children because oftentimes what they really want is to ask a question or to be part of something. Uh, and there's a great drag performer, Taylor Mack, who talks about that when someone heckles you, um, what they're really trying to do is, again, put themselves into that story. And so as a performer, you can reject them, but you can also find a way to integrate them in, in a way that still allows you to kind of control that narrative, but also allows them to be heard. And so that's something that we think, you know, we might encourage a little bit more from children. Not to, you know, talk back incessantly, but to, to kind of learn when it's appropriate to be a little bit defiant, when it's appropriate to be insistent. Um, and as part of that too, again, to sort of return to these politics of drag, um, of disruption, of rejecting binaries, um, is to encourage children to question authority, to encourage them to ask why, and to not be satisfied with the kind of typical answers. We probably all can think of a time when we've been with a child who, you know, asks why and why and why, and eventually you just say, because of your entertainment, lightheartedness, to deal with topics that are painful, to deal with topics that are hurtful, um, that are tough for us to deal with. Uh, in something like Drag Story Hour, this could be reading a book like Everyone Poops by Taro Gomi, which is one of our favorites. Um, and, you know, is a little bit on the edge of kind of being giggly and uh, maybe seeming inappropriate to some kids who are maybe dealing with the stigma of potty training. And, you know, for them being able to laugh about this potentially difficult or traumatic event might actually be part of their learning process. Um, similarly, here you see one of my books, The Hips on the Drag Queen Go Swish, 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 um, which I wrote specifically to encourage kids and families to move their bodies, to swish their hips, to shimmy their shoulders, to snap their fingers, to do some of the things that when I was a kid, I was teased for, for being too feminine, for being too gay, and to really create safe spaces for them to experiment, even if, you know, they don't end up to switch their hips in the end. Um, and we think about, you know, this again as sort of a, a form of broader cultural literacy that isn't just about reading, but is also about being able to interpret culture, right? That drag uh, is always about studying some fine detail of something. It's always about understanding culture in context. And that's a very important form of cultural literacy for children to develop. And then finally, um, we think about moving beyond empathy. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've often had to write in grants for Drag Story Hour is that it helps promote a sense of empathy, you know, towards LGBT kids or, or any number of different type of marginalized group. And while I think that's true, there's also very interesting research and theorization, especially by feminists of color, kind of critiquing ideas of empathy is a way of sort of consuming other people or other cultures rather than kind of understanding our own social relations. And so we position drag not 
someone else's shoes, but really is about trying on your own shoes, trying on pairs of in those different shoes, in those different costumes, in those different personas, helps change who you are and how you're perceived. Um, so it's really more about finding difference and celebrating difference in oneself rather than, you know, trying to sort of take it from somebody else. Um, and similarly, we also think that uh, promoting a sense of, um, or helping children understand drag families and chosen families as one model where they can find love and care outside of traditional family structures is also an important thing for them to learn. Now, because drag queens always add one thing, I have a sixth thing here, which is that in addition to um, children and educators learning from queens, I also think that queens have a lot to learn from children and from doing programs like Drag Story Hour. Uh, I know that I personally have learned a lot about being a college instructor from working not because there's necessarily a similarity, but because I'm able to use some of those similar strategies of developing relationships and humor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I've also found that kind of one allowed me to, and to heal in some ways from those as well. So um, again, the goal is not really to do a better job of kind of LGBT 101 or gender 101 or definitions that can easily be imagine and promote um, or really to promote imaginative and playful ways that help us get out of our standardized ways of being in the world. Uh, as I've talked about, drag offers freedom to experiment, to fail, to iterate, and just happens to do so in a rich queer cultural legacy that can also provide meaningful examples of community leadership for both children. So as I wrap up here, um, what I want to draw is my two case studies. Drag disrupts many different types of binaries, masculinity and femininity, truth and fiction, politics and pleasure, et cetera, et cetera. Hopefully you've all thought of some new ones tonight as well. And if you'll allow me to speak in broad strokes for a moment, we're increasingly living in a world where we're um, being put into boxes and required to choose just one option rather than to celebrate life's complexities. Whether that's how in how our lives get categorized by databases and algorithms or the scripts m children must follow in school to prove their success, too often we are told we are told we can only be one thing or another. Drag inherently rejects this binary thinking and instead insists on multiplicity and messiness, on being able to choose none or all of the above. So in playful ways, as we've seen tonight, by outsmarting algorithms, or to address tough topics, and by adding a little lot of glitter and knowing that it will be impossible to ever vacuum it up out of the carpet. <laughs> so while I have no illusion that drag alone will change the world, I do want to critically examine and celebrate it as a powerful tool, one among many, for activating our imaginations and facilitating the recent attacks on drag are nothing short of a war rather than envision and enact a more just and fabulous world. And I think that the antidote to these things is really to play harder. So in this way, I would say that drag performers are less like royalty ruling over people and we're more like comic book characters or superheroes, where people often gifted with special abilities, though in this case, ones that we can all tap into in our own ways. And so whether in our digital lives, in school, at work, or with family and friends, I encourage us all to think more about how we can live our lives playfully, to find our inner sparkle and to let it shine outward, and to make our own impact on the world by getting in touch with our own inner drag queens. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. So again, um, thank you all for being here. Thank you to everyone who made this event possible. Uh, I did want to share this reading list where, again, you can access some of my articles, some of my children's books. You can watch the, the longer movie if you're interested. 
Um, and again, thank you all so much for being here. Have a fabulous and safe night. Take care. Every great thinker throughout the course of human history has had some. This is the answer. What is the best way to dramatize to?